Welcome to our next lecture in the series on condensed matter theory. In this lecture, I want to talk about Green's functions and we'll focus on the use of Green's functions for independent particles. Um, when we talk about quantum mechanics or the representation of uh, or the description of states in condensed matter theory, then we deal with many particles of the order of 10 to the 23. And if we want to represent a state, a many-body quantum state, then we have a few options to do this. And the standard way to represent a quantum many-body state is by its wave function. And a wave function is a function of n coordinates for n particles. Now, as we have the possibility to have superpositions or quantum entanglement in a quantum many-body system, um, we do not need to know only the coordinates of all particles, but we have a superposition uh, possibility which allows us to have basically for capital N basis functions um, a Hilbert space of in how many ways can you put n electrons in m basis functions. And that grows exponentially fast with system size. So although this is the way that Schrödinger introduced the quantum mechanical representation of a wave of a state, it is not practical for many body systems. Then as Walter Cohn showed, we can for the ground state at least also represent a quantum many body state by the density. Now, of course, when you represent a state by its density, that's a much compacter way to describe a system. It's just a real number for every point in space. And this is something that is really practical. Um, so the good thing is we have a practical way to represent the system. The bad thing is that we do not have um, cis easy ways to calculate the energy or observables from such a density. There is an exact way, given a ground state density, we can always reconstruct the ground state wave function. Um, but then, of course, we run into all the problems of the how do you represent that ground state wave function and it's living in an exponentially growing Hilbert space. So all the problems that we have with wave functions then come back. So there is no practical way in which we can represent the ground state and be able to calculate expectation values or properties of that ground state. One way to do this in a reasonable compact manner that is also practical and allows you to do calculations is with the use of Green's functions. And the Green's functions are functions that depend on a quantum number and a time and a second quantum number and a second time. And what the Green's function tells you is you put in a particle at time t prime, prime in quantum state tau prime, and you remove it sometime later in time t from quantum state tau. So how do you propagate from quantum number or quantum state tau prime to quantum state tau? Of course, we cannot only put in one particle, but we can also put in two particles. So you put one particle in quantum state tau triple, triple prime. At time t triple prime, you put in a particle at state tau double prime at tau double prime, and you remove it at time t prime from state tau prime, and one at time t from state tau. And of course, you can then also go to putting in three particles and removing three particles, etc., etc. If you know all the response functions or Green's functions of your many-body system, your system and your state is completely determined. Now, the nice thing is that um, this is a systematic way to become more and more accurate. If we only know one Green's function, you know a little bit. If you know then also how two particles propagate, you know a bit more. Three particles, you know even more. Um, the amount of information that you need to store, of course, of course becomes larger and larger. But at least this is a practical way in which we can 
store information on our system that is not exponentially large and still allows us to systematically um, become more and more accurate. So how do we define our Green's functions mathematically? And let us first look at the Green's operator. in frequency, or the Lehmann representation. And we will define two different Green's operators. One is the retarded Green's operator, which we will indicate with a plus. It's an operator that depends on the frequency we take the limit of mu to zero, but always bigger than zero, one over omega minus the Hamiltonian plus an energy where E zero is the energy of the ground state or the state that you take the expectation value of. And then we have the advanced Green's function And that is g minus of omega, also the limit, and now minus 1 over omega plus the Hamiltonian minus E0 minus I nu. And why we exactly use these, we will discuss in the next lectures and also make it more intuitive why actually we choose these definitions for our Green's functions. Um, I should remark here that um, what we call a Green's function and a Green's operator is only loosely um, related to the strict mathematical definition. The two point or one particle creation, one particle annihilation Green's function for a mean field Hamiltonian is in the strict mathematical sense a Green's function. All other functions that we will define and call Green's functions are in the strict mathematical sense not really Green's functions. Nonetheless, within um, physics, these are known as the Green's functions. So here we defined our operators. We can now look at the Green's functions. And so far we are just looking at definitions and the Green's function depends on two quantum numbers, tau prime and tau. Um, that could be wave vectors, that could be local points in space, that can be crystal momenta, that can be log waves then, or local Vernier functions. And we take a ground state, expectation value where we create a particle in orbital or in state tau prime. We then have our Green's operator and then we annihilate the particle from state tau. And E0 within the Green's operator is defined as the ground state energy. And the same we can do for the G minus, the advanced Green's function tau tau prime omega is psi zero a dagger tau prime g minus a tau psi zero. And also here E zero is the ground state expectation value of the Hamiltonian. So these are our Green's operators and Green's functions in the frequency domain. We can also look at them in the time domain, which you can get from the frequency domain by the Fourier transform. We will do this in a later lecture, but I want to show you the Green's function and its definition in the time domain. Um, we'll show you that it's self-consistent with a Fourier transform later, but now just to be able to describe the meaning of a Green's function in the time domain, we have tau, tau prime t, which is given as minus i 
and then zero when t is smaller than zero and given by the creation of a particle out of the ground state in quantum, in quantum state tau at time t is equal to zero and annihilating that particle at time t and seeing if you come back to the ground state or not. And g minus is given by the propagation of holes instead of electrons for the ground state expectation value where we first annihilate a particle at time t and then create the particle in quantum state tau prime at time t is equal to zero. So we look here at the expectation value of creating a particle at some time and some time later annihilating the particle for the retarded Green's function or looking at annihilating a particle at time t and creating it at some time later t is equal to zero for the advanced Green's function where you look then at the propagation of holes. Well, we already see that if you have negative time, that would mean that you create a particle and try to annihilate it before you created it. And at that point, that Green's function is zero. And the same here, if you try to annihilate a hole or, or create a hole, annihilate an electron and then create it sometime later, that is okay. If you try to fill that hole that you created before you created it, then your Green's function is zero. So we see nicely that you're at least in some points causal here, that you cannot have actions before you act on it. Um, as said, these quantum numbers tau and tau prime can be any quantum state. You can, for example, look at creating a particle at one point in space and see if you can annihilate it sometime later at another point in space. Um, you can also create a particle in a plane wave or in a block wave um, and see how it propagates through space. Green's functions are not only very useful in quantum mechanics, we also know them in classical physics. For example, if you want to measure the acoustical properties of a big building, a church for example, um, then of course you can make a sign like of sound of a single frequency and measure how much the um, building responds at that frequency. You can also generate a pulse, a delta pulse, a big explosion at some point in time and see how that comes back. And then you measure the Green's functions in time domain, whereas in the first case you would measure your response functions or your Green's functions in the frequency domain. These kind of um, response functions are, for example, used in uh, earth science, where people want to measure if you have fault lines or if there's um, metal reservoirs or oil reservoirs somewhere in the earth, you make a big explosion somewhere and then you measure how the shock waves propagate and come back. Um, that's the same principle of a Doppler effect where you probe how your system or the, the Doppler radar, where you probe how your system reacts when you put in some, either at some frequency or as a pulse in time. And instead of um, using this to measure classical objects, we can use these to measure many body quantum states and in that sense learn something from it. So in the next lectures we will talk about um, the properties of our Green's functions, we'll relate them to the densities of states and the band structure, We'll show you how we go from the frequency to the time domain and then look at some calculations that we can do with Green's functions that otherwise would be very difficult. Thank you very much. Stay healthy. We see each other later.